Thanks everybody that came today to listen to this um, presentation. Um, I'm excited to be here and I, I wish I could have been here at the award, uh, the Larson Award for my grandfather. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is David Merrill Primus, middle name named after my grandfather's family. Um, today I, I live in Gunnison, Colorado. It takes a while to get here from there, right along the Continental Divide. Um, I grew up in Denver, uh, and uh, I've always had a passion for Colorado history, um, primarily because of my grandfather and my grandmother, who was a native uh, Denverite. I've written two books. Uh, this is one, Steamboat Springs, which is really more of an editing job because those are all my grandfather's writings. Uh, and then I recently published a book called Beneath Blue Mesa, the Gunnison River Valley before the reservoir. And so that reservoir covered up 23 miles of prime trout fishing river. And my grandfather always lamented the fact that that was covered up because he fished there a lot. Of course, he came here a lot too, and so did I. Um, I often, t he was a great storyteller, of course, um, and, uh, and I always heard his stories about growing up in Steamboat. And he moved to Denver after he graduated as an engineer to make a living, but his heart was always in Route County leave me and he took his family myself included um, camping and uh, fishing and, and of course to the ski carnival uh, almost every summer and winter uh, as I was growing up and that was in the 60s and you're right steamboat has changed <laughs> <laughs> uh, so most of the stories in this book were originally printed in the steamboat pilot he was a a real a good friend of Morris Leckenby uh, and uh, continued to send stories and letters to the editor um, all the time uh, to the pilot. Uh, and um, I, you know, as I said, I'd heard a lot of stories from him uh, in the 60s and the 70s all the way until he died uh, in 86. He also loved to sketch and take pictures, draw maps, that type of thing uh, and you know he just made a huge impact on me and his love of the western slope is I'm sure why I live in Gunnison today I needed to get away from the city which I did when I was 21 and I never looked back um, and of course he well maybe not of course you don't know much about him but you will after this I think uh, he had a real love of math and science and uh, so did I and I've had a successful career in <laughs> technology, uh, again, probably because of him. But anyway, it's a little bit about myself. Um, let me show you a few photographs from the book uh, and kind of in chronological order of the family coming here. Um, they moved here actually in um, the uh, spring of 1904, or let's see, 1905, sorry. My grandfather was four years old at the time. Of course, that was before the train uh, that came here in 1909. So they took the train from uh, Carroll, Nebraska, where he was born, uh, to Wolcott, and then took the stage, it's a picture of the stage, from Wolcott um, to Steamboat. And as I recall him saying, I think that was a two-day trip, and I know they overnighted uh, in Yampa. And I think he kind of remembered that. Four years old is pretty young. Um, but what he did remember uh, was arriving on the other side of the Yampa River, uh, and and I think it was at it was at night, and uh, this is what he really remembers. And let me read a little excerpt out of the book about his arrival in Steamboat. As a boy of four, I don't remember much of that day and a half stage ride from Wolcott, except the weather was terrible. We spent the, f the first night in Yampa or at State Bridge. I do, however, clearly remember our Concord stagecoach overturning in a mud hole in Brooklyn, the suburb across the river 
from Steamboat that was supported by many houses of evil and a number of <laughs> saloons. Steamboat was dry. You probably know that. We expect to get into town. We expected to get into town about six o'clock that evening, but due to a heavy red rainstorm, the stage got stuck in the mud and turned over on the south side of the river. My mother, with my year-old brother Hollis, had to get out in the mud and sit under some cottonwood trees. About midnight, my father and the stage driver went over to some of the saloons and tried to raise some enthusiasm among the clients at the bars to help us out of the mud hole. Due to their efficiency being kind of low at that time of the night, <laughs> even though he had plenty of al even though they had plenty of alcohol to boost their spirits, it took quite a crew of happy-go-lucky fellows to ride us and get us back on the road. To say the least, my mother was not exactly impressed with her arrival into the, this world-famous town of Steamboat Springs. <laughs> so they moved here. They moved into this house, which is no longer there. That was at Oak and Third. Um, and of course, Oak is one street north of Lincoln, and uh, he could see Lincoln from the porch. And let me read you a little bit about that. When we first arrived in Steamboat, we rented a small cottage at the east end of town. From there, I could look down on Main Street and watch the stages come in across Spring Creek, all spattered with mud in rainy weather. To me, their time schedule was more accurate than the Moffat Railroad when it came in some years later, around Christmas 1909. So, uh, a little bit about the Merrills in general and why my grandfather's family moved here. Uh, his grandfather, uh, also Marcellus uh, Samuel Merrill, uh, moved here in the 1890s from Carroll, Nebraska. And he was about 60 years old at the time. He was a successful banker in Nebraska. And as near as I can tell, and my grandfather could tell, he kind of got bored and moved west to as far west as he could in Steamboat in the 1890s was a real frontier town because unlike many Colorado towns had no train so it was the Wild West I think um, and then he started and uh, built the first National Bank building which of course is still there and I drove past it in now I guess it's a art museum yes which is nice instead of a t-shirt shop as it was a few years ago um, but I was glad to say see that building still remains I hope it can uh, continue. He also started a bank in Craig, so he was like a real entrepreneur. But he was also in a lot of other businesses too. This is a picture of the Empire Lumber Company, um, which is at uh, on 10th Street near the Yamper River, and that that's the office there. And uh, being in the lumber business, of course, he had. Uh, several sawmills. This is a sketch my grandfather uh, drew of the sawmill at Big Creek, uh, which is about, you probably know this, but 10 miles kind of northwest of Steamboat. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I'll point out a couple of things. My grandfather, the cookhouse, um, I can't quite read that, but this is the sawmill, the saw engine with boiler and back, lumber, logs, Bunkhouse, Big Creek, Log Bridge, mill site looking north toward the Elk River Divide. Typical of my grandfather, very detailed uh, record. Uh, he also, they also owned um, a sawmill at Yampa, and uh, the first year they built that, it burned to the ground. They had no insurance and lost $4,000. And my grandfather always said arson was suspected. I don't know any more about that, but I was in Yampa yesterday and noticed that there were like 12 sawmills in Yampa, so there was probably a lot of competition and they probably weren't happy with the Merrills arriving to build yet another sawmill, my guess, I don't know. Uh, they were also into, or he, my great-great-grandfather, my grandfather's grandfather, uh, was also uh, into ranching. This is a picture of their ranch um, near Yampa, and um, my um, my uh, grandfather's mother 
um, said, you know, Steamboat was just a cow town. She, I don't think she was ever impressed from moving from the relative civilization of Nebraska to Steamboat. And my grandmother, my grandfather's wife, felt the same way, believe me. She came here with him only because she was a dutiful wife, I think. Um, she, uh, she, was, uh, she wanted to be the high-class Denverite, you know. My grandfather did not. Uh, and he, he remembers, you know, thousands of cattle, um, you know, often coming down Lincoln Avenue in the morning. And my grandfather was never much for ranching, uh, but he did do a lot of work on, on ranches as a boy. And this is a photograph that I took um, a few years ago. And my grandfather remembers working at a ranch owned by Jim Brobeck. And he said that was on Four Mile Hill, four miles, which is four miles west of town. Um, and I ran into a rancher, I forget his name, talked to him about this story and he says, oh, I, I'm pretty sure that um, that is the ranch that he remembers uh, they leased it, I think, from Jim Brobeck, and that's the barn. And let me read you uh, a little excerpt about that. I had the horses to take care of, cows to milk, and chickens to feed. Usually when Dad was out of town and it was 40 below zero, the horses would start a rumpus in the barn in the middle of the night. Mother would say, Marcellus, I hear a disturbance in the barn. You will have to go and straighten those horses out. I would usually say, I don't hear anything, and she would say, well, go out and see what's the matter. I would put on my barn clothes, take the kerosene lamp, and go off to the barn. I would usually find a horse down. I would quiet the horses, set the horse on its feet, and back into a stall, and beat it back into the house. Again, I don't think he was that into ranching. Um, he did... Uh, he did, uh, as a teenager, help, and this is a little picture of Jim Norville's cow camp um, on the 20 mile. And um, so let me read you a little bit about that. Here I was, left with four old cow punchers. I thought of them as old since I was only 14. I was assigned to sleep with Big Bill, who was the past, a past product of Buffalo Bill's show. Naturally, he thought he knew everything about the cattle business, plus all the know-how of breaking horses. This, at times, created quite a mild dispute in cow cowboy language. From his stories, I gathered that Big Bill's gang had a wild time when they were abroad, especially in Paris. The first night with Big Bill is the only night I can remember. Such a night. I cried most of it as it was the first time I had been away from home. The pack rats started to race between the beams on top of the old newspaper and flower paste covered ceiling. Soon, too many of them congregated at one point. The old paper and paste gave way and about a dozen of the rats came down. One fat run rat found an opening between Big Bill and me and was soon under the cover at our feet. I, I yelled and jumped out of bed, but Big Bill slept peacefully on. After freezing a few minutes, I decided the best place was in bed after all, and reluctantly crawled back in. <laughs> and um, my final ranching picture is of the Merrill brand, Bar Lazy M. And my grandfather was always really proud of that cattle brand, partly because it's a single letter with a bar, which means it's a pretty early brand. And uh, he, he had that all over the place, including he had a house in Georgetown, and he, he had a metal railing built, and that was in, incorporated into the metal railing and so forth. And um, after a few, well, quite a few years ago, I formed a little small company called Bar Lazy M LLC, and now that's my logo, which I don't know if that's in this book, but it's in my other book, so. And uh, of course, that wasn't enough businesses. His great, his grandfather was also into mining. And this is a picture of their mine, 
at Fish Creek Falls in 1955. And I, he never showed me, uh, that's, that's his brother's daughter there at the mine, and uh, he never showed me where that mine was, and I have no idea, and I'm sure it's covered up by now, but kind of interesting. What kind of a mine? Coal? What? Uranium? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know let's what go type. Find it. <laughs> yeah, let's go find it. Let's see if it's still ours. You know? I'm sure we paid taxes on it all those years. There's a uranium mine up there. Yeah. Is there? Yes. I can't believe they would have. Would they? I don't think they would have been going after uranium in the early 1900s. No, I'm saying, but interesting so a little bit about living in steamboat this is a picture of their house on crawford avenue um, which is 1062 crawford street which is about a block east of the crawford home uh, and uh, these houses are still there and they look pretty much the same with some additions um, his his grandfather uh, once the train came ordered two kit houses from sears Oh, and had them delivered on the train and his grandfather built his house here and then he built a house for his son and family here and this is you know uh, my grandfather's mother and two of the boys standing on on the porch uh, and uh, I should say that I should say the kind of the end of the overall Merrill story in Steamboat is when my great-great-grandfather arrived here in the 1890s he brought a lot of money like I've been told like forty thousand dollars so do the math and figure what that is today a fair amount of money to build up these businesses and he was an incredible entrepreneur and then he invited his son um, uh, my grandfather's father to join him and his son was just not the businessman that my that my grandfather's grandfather was and uh, so when my grandfather's grandfather passed away his son inherited all these businesses and struggled to make them work and eventually basically lost all the businesses and all the money and um, by this time it was in the early 20s uh, my grandfather went to school, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, at University of Colorado, uh, and he was away, and he had gotten a job in Schenectady, New York, his first job as an engineer in 1923, and uh, he got a telegram uh, that his father had taken his own life. And uh, that was pretty much the end of the Merrill family in Steamboat, because his mother and two younger brothers sold whatever else there was here and got on the train and joined my grandfather in Schenectady. Mm -hmm. So I didn't hear that story until I was like 19 years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but a question. Yeah. Is he the one that kind of failed? My, why did, why my did he take his life? Yeah, because that was my grandfather's okay. father who was the okay. son of the, my, right. okay. the guy that really was a successful entrepreneur and he just, didn't have it in him. That's what my grandfather always said. He just didn't have that business acumen or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's move on to happier things. Uh, <laughs> school days. Um, a lot of these writings are of his early memories. I mean, from five years old when he got here to about 18 when he left to go to school. That's a picture of first grade in 1907. Uh, of course, the red arrow is my grandfather. Uh, and he always loved that he went to school at the little log schoolhouse on Butcher Knife Creek, which is at Pine and Fifth, and I think that's still there, right? I don't know. Used to be. So. I should go by and look. Yeah. Or maybe not. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, that was at Pine and Fifth, and uh, this is his sketch of the schoolhouse, the woodshed, the pump, uh, Mrs. Bowine, I think, teacher, uh, and then Butcher Knife Creek. And what I do know is that Butcher Knife Creek is still there, but it's completely underground at that point. It's like in pipes, right, mm -hmm. at that spot. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he wasn't much of an academic. 
he had lots of fun at school, uh, but he managed to flunk first and fourth grade, okay? And uh, let me read you why, I guess. A boy in school just had to be a spitball artist. Now this took a lot of design work to be really efficient. Spit, remember he was, became an engineer, right? Uh, spitballs were the forerunner of our modern missile programs. We all used to spend hours building up a supply and building a launching device was not a little problem. You got a piece of paper rolling it diagonally into a tube a little bit over a quarter inch in diameter. If possible, you got some of the teacher's mucilage to glue it together. Otherwise, you used a generous supply of spit. Now, to make the spitballs, you took a sheet from your tablet, stuck it in your mouth, and chewed it up with a good lot of spit. You then wallered, wallered it around your mouth until it became a ball the size of your tube. You then took it out, letting it dry a little. Now comes the launching. Usually you did this when the teacher turned her head or when she went in to shovel some coal into the stove. You picked out your target, boy or girl, even 10 feet away, and put the spitball in the end of the tube next to your mouth. Then you aimed it, allowing for some drop, and if you didn't hit the object on the side of the cheek, you were just no good. <laughs> So he finally graduated uh, from high school here in Steamboat uh, in about 1917, 1918, and he decided to go uh, to engineering school at CU. Uh, and that's a picture of him graduating in 1923, which interestingly enough is 100 years ago today. Right? Uh, he had some health problems as a young man in New York, in Schenectady. I don't really know exactly why, but he felt he needed to come back to the Colorado air, and, uh, and did, and like I said, he ended up in Denver, and the reason he ended up in Denver is because his brother Hollis had started a company called Merrill Axel and Wheel Service, and that's an early picture of that, uh, that company, uh, we stopped shimmy, you know what that is? Like, luckily it doesn't ha happen very much anymore. Hard steering, uh, axles and frames straightened. That was the business his brother had started uh, in 1928 in Denver. And so he joined his brother there to help him as a partner and run the business. And by 1933, five years later, uh, they had shops in uh, Denver, Pueblo, Omaha, Nebraska, Des Moines, Iowa, La Long Beach, California, and Oklahoma City. My grandfather inherited those entrepreneurial genes from his grandfather, believe me. Um, and, but he was really an engineer and he wasn't a mechanic. Uh, and so, uh, and so in, by 1935, he had already um, started inventing things. And of course, he was in the automotive business, so he invented uh, a, some sort of device to straighten uh, frames and axles and got a patent on it. So in 1935, he obtained the first of 64 patents Whoa. through his life. Uh, and meantime, and I don't have the exact date of this, Hollis had a heart attack and died as a young man. And my grandfather always maintained that's because Hollis contracted the Spanish flu in 1918 and his heart was weak. And then 10 or 15 years later, uh, he passed away. His other brother, Conrad, uh, had started a early airport in New Jersey and was in an early pilot. And by 19, about 1945, his plane crashed and he died too. So he lost, my grandfather lost both of his brothers by the time he was about, you know, in his 40s. Anyway, um, like I said, my grandfather continued running Merrill Axel and Wheel Service, but that was a side interest. He hired a manager and, and or managers of all those different shops and uh, started Merrill Engineering Laboratories. And this is that same building modernized by my grandfather with Merrill Axel on the right and Merrill Engineering Laboratories on the left. And that was in downtown Denver on, on Lincoln Street, 1230 Lincoln. And that's when he really started 
doing a lot of inventing uh, and he invented all sorts of machines for the automotive industry uh, including a wheel balancer uh, that was called a dynamic wheel balancer because you could leave the wheel on the car jack the car up and spin it up to like 50 miles an hour and then it would shake and uh, without getting into too much detail balancing depends on how, how fast something's going so his balancer did a better job than the bubble balancer that are actually used today mm -hmm. uh, and then he also when he was about 60 he invented a uh, wheel aligner uh, that was used by in automobile factories throughout the world and the reason was is because all these factories could turn out uh, a car a minute on their assembly lines and at the very last thing they had to do was align the wheels and that took three or four minutes so there was a bottleneck my grandfather invented a machine huge machine about as big as this room that was sunk in a pit and uh, it would spin the wheels up measure the alignment the guy would be underneath he'd look at the the error make some adjustments spin them up again make one more adjustment and shoot the car off in a minute. And mm -hmm. my grandfather was very successful in later part of his life selling was like I said, all over the world. He was also really well known for his balancing expertise. In World War II, the army or the government recruited him to do balancing of props on planes, gave him an unlimited gas pass. Um, and he. He balanced fans at the Henderson Project, which is on Empire Pass, um, hydroelectric turbines. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember going some really cool places because, for me, all this, all this mechanical stuff and so forth. Anyway, this is a picture of him hard at work uh, in his office, uh, and you know he's got his bow tie on and the suit and looks pretty professional. But look at this picture closely and you'll see the six-shooter <laughs> and the box of Remington shells <laughs> and the fly swatter. I think that's also put in here for comic effect. One of my favorite pictures of my grandfather, um, that's for darn sure. I should also mention that throughout his career, he hired lots of Rock County people and um, a couple of these maybe that you're, you're aware of the family. Uh, Pete Wither worked for him, which was Dorothy Wither's brother. Uh, Bill Fisher, uh, Wilma May, uh, who was a Fisher. Uh, Lawrence Alfred, I'm sure lots more, but he, he, he really did love to provide um, employment for people that were looking for work. But he also invented a lot of things for fun and passion. Uh, and like I said, or maybe I didn't say enough of, he was a real outdoorsman. He loved to fish, he loved to hunt, he loved to ski. Uh, and this is a fishing rod carrier he invented in the 1930s to stick to the top of your car and carry your fishing rods. That's called carrier rod. And then, of course, he was into skiing, and so he invented a ski carrier that worked the same way. A very early ski carrier, and there was lots of iterations of that ski carrier over the years. Uh, and this, of course, is at Aspen at the Hotel Jerome and uh, my grandmother in front of their car. Okay. He was also, excuse me. What kind of car is that? Cadillac. I think that's a Cadillac, and he was connected with the automotive industry tightly, and so he would often go to Detroit and buy a car a year old that one of the executives had been using, you know. So that, that happened a lot. So that's why he, he, he drove the newest cars, pretty much. He was also a partner in the Groswald Ski Company in Denver. Uh, he invented the first American three-point binding in 1938. Um, like I said, skiing was his passion. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But he also liked to jeep. And after World War II, uh, he bought a house in Georgetown, Colorado, primarily because he couldn't think in Denver. He couldn't do his creative work in the city. And so he moved to Georgetown um, and then bought a World War II surplus Jeep and started jeeping all these old mining trails in the 40s. And I, 
I have a Jeep today. I mean, my family's been Jeeping forever. But anyway, he built, he invented the jumping Jeep step. And the reason was is because if you Jeep and there's a, there's a step here and you have some rocks, that step can get broken off. Happens today. So he built one that would fold up underneath the Jeep uh, and when the rocks hit it and then it had springs and it would fold back down again um, after you were over the rock and and he sold that for a while and I think sold it to a company to market it and I don't know why they still don't have those things today um, but anyway maybe I should revive them I would say. of course back to the steamboat connection uh, the Steamboat Springs High School Band uh, that oftentimes performed down uh, Lincoln Avenue at Winter Carnival on skis was invited to go uh, participate in the Lions International Parade in Chicago, Illinois in 1950, July of 1950. No snow in July. So he invented rollers that all the kids could uh, ski down the pavement uh, in uh, Chicago. So a little bit about about his his fun uh, that he had as boys, uh, and he had a lot of fun. This was his boyhood invention of an Indian arrow, and he says, with this arrow you could put a mark on a cow shed or chicken house as a target. Whenever you hit the target, pin the pin would remain in the board at the location and the arrow would drop off. So you're having a competition with your buddy. Oh, that's my pin. I got closer to this, to the target than you. <laughs> he was a big fan of the bathhouse. That's an early picture of the bathhouse and pool in, in Steamboat Springs. Uh, let me read you a little bit about that. With the laying of the Moffat Railroad line into Steamboat in 1909, immediate construction of a new bathhouse was begun. Boy, was it some bathhouse. It had two stories and an inside and an outside pool. It had a bunch of wild and ornery boys and girls yelling, yelling and bellering, playing tag, making a playground for sure. There were no lifeguards to interfere saying, be careful, the water is over your head or you will slip on the rocks. Most of the time, the boys never had the 10 cent admission to the bathhouse, so the manager would let us in free if we dug dandelions for an hour or two. We still have that set up today. Yes, there you go. Yeah. Um, and I should mention that Dorothy Wither, um, that owned the Dorothy shop for years uh, on Lincoln Avenue, was a lifelong friend. When I was a, a boy, a little boy, we'd always go to the Dorothy shop as part of our our excursion to Steamboat and visit Dorothy. And this happened year after year after year after year for me. And then I turned 18 and graduated from high school and I wanted to do something fun. So my friend and I talked my grandfather into loaning us his Jeep and we came up to Steamboat Jeeping. Of course, this is 1975. I had fairly long hair um, and I walked in to say hi to Dorothy because that's what you do and she had no idea who I was and like I could tell she really wanted me out of her shop but finally I convinced her that I was Marcellus's grandson and I was okay <laughs> <laughs> or sort of okay <laughs> picture of my grandfather or a sketch of my grandfather skiing. We'll talk a little bit more about skiing in a little bit. Uh, this is a picture of the Merrill boys sitting on the step of the house and look closely. They've got a magnifying glass and what do you think they're doing? Burning ants. Nasty boys. Yes. And he loved to play marbles or his, he called them migs. That's a sketch of course. He often made those from local clay and talked his mother into baking them in, in her oven, which she wasn't so happy with, but I guess allowed. Uh, and let me read you a little bit about Migs. My strongest memory of these marble days was the time with the Trinder boys, Ed and Paul, when the Trinder boys, Ed and Paul, invited me over one snowy Saturday morning to play in their basement. The basement had a good ground floor. The light was 
kind of on the dim side, but nobody minded because it was kind of a shady business anyway. <laughs> well, the reason for this generous invitation of the Trinder Boys to me was not because they loved me. It was because they thought they could take all my marbles away from me. That morning I had a pocket full, so we went down to the basement. This was one of my most fortunate mornings. By noon I had all the Trinder Boys marbles, which meant that my pockets were stuffed pretty full. I started going up the stairs toward the door, but who, lo and behold, should confront me but Mrs. Trinder herself? She immediately asked, what have you boys been doing? The Trinder boys immediately offered a lot of information which I thought would have been better concealed, <laughs> but they had nothing to lose. Under her bombardment of questions, they not only told their mother they had been playing for keeps, but that Sally Merrill had all their marbles. Before I could get past her, she grabbed me, turned me upside down, and all the marbles fell out of my pocket. Not only the marbles I had won, but my own. I went home empty-handed. That was the last time I ever played in the Trinder Boys hangout in their basement. <laughs> and I should mention, I don't think I've mentioned it yet, his name was Marcellus, but his nickname was Sally from the time he was a little boy and throughout his, his life. That's what all of his friends called him. That's a picture of him uh, watching Mrs. Whitcomb's chickens, I think right up there near the house on Crawford in about 1910. And uh, his job was to stand there and, I don't know, wait till a coyote came and he had a 22 and killed the coyote and he'd get five cents per coyote to keep the chickens safe. Uh, this is a picture of building Rabdeer's Pass um, in 1916. He was about 15 or 16 years old. He got a job up there as the cook's helper and then soon was, I guess, promoted to be the powder monkey, which meant that in construction sites, I think even today, you keep the explosives away from the crew up the hill. And so when they needed more explosives, they'd send this 16-year-old boy up the hill, he'd grab a bunch of dynamite, um, and then bring it down to the job site. And he lived through that, so. <laughs> and I often remember coming over rabbit ears with him and him pointing out that the old road that he built, which it's probably been built a couple of times since then, but in the 60s it had already been rebuilt since the 16, 1916 road. Uh, the family was really very religious. This is the Uzoa Congregational Church uh, at Fifth and Pine. Um, and uh, he worked here in the early Sunday mornings. His job was to get up really early and go fire up the coal furnace in time for the church to heat up uh, for the service. Uh, let me read you a bit about religion. Um, this is about a guy named Jim Norvell. Uh, one Christmas, he was playing poker with a number of the merchants in town, and around midnight he had all their money. He asked, what else do you have to put up? They said they had a freight wagon load of turkeys that had come in. Jim said, I'll take that as collateral. The next day, with, which was a day or two before Christmas, the merchants wanted to buy the turkeys back. Jim Norville said, oh no, they are my turkeys and it was impossible for the merchants to get any more turkeys on that short notice into Steamboat. The day before Christmas, Jim got a couple of his cowpunchers and they rode down Lincoln Avenue, throwing out those turkeys to the many citizens who had gathered along the street. The turkeys were distributed to not only the prosperous, but also the poor citizens of Steamboat, with the famous Christmas chant, Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. <laughs> So a little bit about fishing. As I said, he loved to fish. His mother, Carolyn, uh, was nicknamed uh, Carrie, uh, and she loved to paint. And this is a picture of Fish Creek Falls, of course, uh, in 1915. And a little bit of story about Fish Creek from my grandfather. The greatest achievement of picnicking at Fish Creek Falls was the climb down into the falls. That was quite an endeavor for any gal or man too in those days. 
There is a fine trail now cut around the edge, dropping down to the bridge across the creek. In early days, there was no bridge, nor was there any trail. You used to climb further up to the point and come down there, sliding and grabbing bushes and trees best as you could to hold yourself as they came down off that precipitous rocky cliff into the canyon. A skinned knee, you can all imagine what that's like, right? I can. A skinned knee or a bruised hand was all part of the day's fun. More adventurous individuals would then climb up a rock located halfway up the falls. As you climbed up onto this rock, you would get a spray of pure mountain water. If you could get down into the canyon with your fishing tackle, it was a darn poor fisherman that couldn't get a dozen native trout to take home that evening. <laughs> so this is a picture uh, that he labels as um, his hunting camp on Sand Mountain, which is southwest of Hans Peak. Uh, and those are in the background there, uh, according to him. And Hans Peak doesn't look quite like that, but anyway. Uh, and I was kind of amazed as a boy of 13, 14, 15, that he said, oh yeah, we used to go hunting when we were 14 years old, just me and my friend, and we we hunt with guns and stuff unsupervised and I thought that was a pretty good idea. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, he, I wanted to show you this because when he always took his hobbies or his passions and combined them with advertisements for his business. And so this is a, on the back there's an advertisement for Merrill Axel Wheel Service. But what this is, and I'll just read you this, for the want of a match, I couldn't make camp and a beautiful buck I missed, so you don't, so you won't forget to take all your gear, I printed up this list, Sally Merrill. <laughs> so on the flip side, in the inside was the extensive list of what not to forget when you go hunting or fishing. <laughs> Another sketch of skiing, uh, says on there 10 to 12 foot skis with a long pole for balancing. We rode that we rode as a break on steep hills. And when they were little boys, you know, they were not little boys, but uh, before uh, Carl Housen arrived, they would make their own skis. And then uh, Carl Housen arrived, I forget exactly when, I'm sure somebody knows, but about when they were teenagers. My grandfather was a teenager and taught all the boys to ski jump, of course. And this is his story about that. Ah, here it tells me. This changed in 1913 when Carl Hausen, the Norwegians, showed up in Steamboat. He said he came because of the wonderful snow and the fact he could get beefsteak for 15 cents a pound. Anyway, he and Prestrude of Dillon held the first tournament on Woodchuck Hill and everybody came to see them jump. I remember it so well. All the ranchers and townspeople took wagons with fur lap robes to see the ski jumping from the area just north of Soda Spring. Carl Housen and Peter Prestrude made a twin jump. Oh boy, everybody yelled and hollered at that. I suppose they jumped about 70 feet down the hill. It was quite the sight. Uh, and uh, Let's see if I've got this, another picture. That is a photograph I think my grandfather took of his brother Hollis uh, jumping at Halson Hill in 1916. Uh, and uh, he, Hollis was kind of the best of the three boys, my grandfather and his two brothers, at jumping. And he was invited to come to the Lake Placid Olympics in 1924. And fell uh, at one of his qualifying runs, I guess, and uh, my grandfather said it about broke Hollis's heart, because he was quite the skier, Conrad was quite the skier, and my grandfather was uh, quite the skier, and he loved ski jumping and supported um, skiing in Colorado all of his life. Uh, he started giving the trophy for the long standing jump uh, at the ski carnival in 1940, and that was his way of honoring the longest jump, as long as you were standing, no matter the style. And, uh, <laughs> and so that was that was a, a big deal uh, for him to do. He also helped financially helped start uh, Arapahoe Basin and Winter Park, 
Um, I remember going to A Basin with him as a kid and he'd walk up to the ticket booth at the time and the tickets were probably five bucks or something. Um, but he'd get free tickets at the ticket booth and I thought, wow, that's pretty something. And the other thing I remember really well, I was about 15 years old and we were all at the, I think we were at the uh, night event of the ski carnival, because I remember it was night. And, uh, and we went up, he took me up to the announcer's booth and, and I felt pretty special being on top of that little structure there. And, uh, and then the next day, uh, we went and watched the uh, ski jumping and I don't know what, where he went. And we were all there in the car and all of a sudden, and he was 72 years old, and all of a sudden we hear, well, Marcellus Merrill is gonna, gonna make a jump. Uh, and my grandmother was just, oh, she was just beside herself. And I don't, I mean, he didn't do the 90 meter, but probably the, six, I don't know, it wasn't the 90 meter, but maybe the 60 meter, I think there's one of those. Anyway, and he lived through that too. Uh, in 1978, he was uh, inducted uh, into the Colorado Ski Museum Hall of Fame in Vail. Um, anyway, he loved skiing. Um, my last slide is a picture of my grandfather in 1978. When he was in Denver as a businessman, he dressed like a businessman, but when he was in his comfort zone, he dressed like that. And he had that ratty old hat. My grandmother hated that hat um, with a passion. Um, that was him being looking very uh, happy. Um, and, uh, you know, as I say, I've have so many vivid memories of visiting Steamboat with him as a kid. Uh, we camped at a campground on Buffalo Pass. Uh, my mother just told me the other day that that was the first camping trip they'd taken me on when I was five years old. And of course my grandfather was there too. And I guess the next day I woke up and I opened the tent door and I said to my mom, I said, this is the funnest day of my life. <laughs> A little later, when I was a teenager, my grandfather had this kind of good idea to get with his friend Ed Grosbeck, who he'd grow, grown up with, and uh, take us city kids uh, on a horseback trip up to the flat tops. And so again, I had pretty long hair, so did my buddies, and a group of us went up there, and he had knew some ranchers up in the area probably around the amp, I guess, and uh, rented three horses. Two horses for the old men, they're, they're by this time 74 years old, and a horse to pack the rest of the stuff. And so off we went, and must have hiked, and the kids hiked, and they were the horses about four or five miles into the flat tops. Ed uh, hobbled the horses in a meadow, we made camp, uh, and then my grandfather said, well, why don't you boys just go ride those horses? And we didn't know anything about horses, believe me. <laughs> and so we knew we had to unhobble them, so we did that. And before we could get on these two horses, we only unhobbled two of them. That was a good idea. Uh, and uh, the horses just sort of scampered away. And so we kind of scampered after them and the horses would let us get right up to them and they'd scamper away. And pretty, soon, pretty soon we were running after them down the trail where we'd parked the Jeep at this campground. I don't know how I was so lucky I had the key to the Jeep in my pocket. But anyway, and the horses all the way down would just um, wait until we could touch them and then they'd run away. They were just playing with us and they got on the gravel road and they headed back to the ranch and I thought, these two young, long-haired hippie boys are not gonna get these horses back. And then the old men are gonna be caught up there, or you know, trapped up there at the flat, flat tops. So well, we finally got the horses and led them back and it started to rain and we got on the horses bareback and we were like in command, believe me. I don't know how we learned to ride horses so quickly, but we weren't letting them get away. And we come around a curve, and there was Ed Grosbeck in his rain slicker, under a tree on top of his horse, on top of the third horse, smoking a cigar. <laughs> and he says, "Boys, are you ready to go back to camp now?" <laughs> yeah. So. Um, 
anyway, um, I, as I was saying to uh, someone earlier, I'd come up to Steamboat and it was my introduction to ranchers and my grandfather seemed to know everybody. We'd have coffee, we'd got a piece of pie. Um, and I just have really, really fond memories of him. Uh, and the last thing I remember is by the time I'm early 20s, mid 20s, um, he was in bad health a lot. And he would, it seemed like every other, I don't know, he was always in intensive care, it seemed like. Mm -hmm. And I was starting my life, and, and you know, my, we, my first wife and I were in Iowa visiting her friends or her family at Christmas. And my father called and said, you know, your, your grandfather's in the hospital again, in intensive care. And I said, I didn't really think anything of it because I've been down this road before, and, but we got in the car started driving back on I-80 and it's never happened before and it never happened since I just like lost consciousness I and I, weird I like went into this zone for like 20 seconds and I kind of woke up mm. and I was going over the line and I corrected and everything was fine and I keep on driving along and I noted it was like 10:30 on whatever day it was and that's the exact time my grandfather died mm. <laughs> Say <a> goodbye. <laughs> All right, uh, I was too emotional. <laughs> anyway, that's my uh, presentation. So where was you at? I just like that. Where was you at in that zone? Was you on I eighty? Yeah, I was on I eighty. Oh, oh, I was in 